Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, inside controls here. Again, this chamber is plumbed up with dual controls. We have outside controls and inside controls. The valves that we looked at earlier on the outside that are taped in the open position feed these two valves here, a supply right down here and then an exhaust here. So if I were to open this valve right here, I'm going to be able to pressurize the chamber from the inside. This is not normally used. Uh, it is simply there as an option. This is a Navy plumb chamber and that's the way the Navy did it back in the day. This is a diffuser to disperse the air uh, inside the chamber. This device right here is the exhaust. So if I wanted to exhaust the valve from inside, I could vent some air out, out here. And the reason we have a T here, again, is to prevent any kind of differential pressure uh, injury. If I were to put a hand up against this and I didn't have the opposite T, it would literally want to suck my hand outside that, that exhaust T. Okay, so these are your inside controls not normally used, but during a normal run, you will hear gas when we pressurize the chamber and vent the chamber coming between these two valves. These go outside to the main controls that you'll use to ventilate the chamber if you're an operator. So when you vent the chamber, you can tell what I'm talking about when we want to hold the vent for at least 30 seconds. We're only getting a very small amount of circulation here. Typically, we like to take this exhaust and run it under the deck plate as we do it in DDC2. But you are going to see chambers like this plumbed this way in the field. Be very aware of this exhaust T when we are exhausting the chamber. Again, if you're out in the field and you see a exhaust and it just has a an open-ended pipe fitting that represents a serious hazard for a differential pressure injury. Do not want to cover that up. If you were at depth and somebody opened that valve, it would literally want to suck your hand outside that uh, uh, that T. Moving on, these are again are our controls. Moving on over here on the outside, we looked at an external supply that went through a check valve with nothing hooked to it. There's nothing hooked on the inside. It simply goes to a manifold here. We use this where we could run auxiliary heliox supplies or nitrox supplies to another bib mask. So these are ball valves to control that. Um, and then we would have to plug the corresponding exhaust into this manifold here. So these are separate supplies. Let's talk about some of the other penetrators that we have here in the chamber in DDC-1. This right here simply represents an open-ended fitting, again with a T, to prevent differential pressure injury. This, on the other side of this, is our dead man valve, our spring-loaded ball valve that when we open that, it takes the gas from the inner lock and we'll put it into the outer lock. Moving over to the right here, you'll see this penetrator right here uh, is for our communications. This is for your comm connector, and then you have your CalRAD speaker up here. Again, open comms. All you have to do is speak, and Topside will talk to you through the same speaker. And then we also have a sound powered phone, which is similar to the coffee cans with a line between them. Uh, they don't work real well, but they're uh, better than nothing. Uh, incidentally, while we're on the subject of loss of comms in the chamber, not necessarily an emergency, simply because you can actually shout and talk outside and the occupants on the inside can hear you, provided that it's a relatively quiet environment. Here, in marine tech, it does work very well. Also, we could simply hold up a note uh, to the occupants inside if we needed to have instructions delivered to them. So, loss of comms, not necessarily an emergency. These here are rarely used during a normal operation, but you may see these offshore. Okay, moving right along, as far as other components go, we have our internal caisson gauge here, calibrated in feet of seawater. Uh, that is going to give us an approximate depth of where we're at. Uh, again, the final uh, calibrated depth gauge is on the outside, but this is usually plus or minus uh, two feet. So there's your caisson gauge, and it's open at the back, so it simply senses the pressure. Then moving on down into this area here, we have this chamber is uniquely fitted with a carbon dioxide scrubber, and it's rare that we will use this uh, except when we do treatment runs. When we use the chamber for long periods of time, we can actually run this chamber on closed circuit. So all we would have to do is turn our switch on the outside for the CO2 scrubber 
and this is sold with Sodazorb, which is a carbon dioxide absorbent. And there's actually a fan when we turn it on, and it's going to take air from inside the chamber and force it up through this canister and remove carbon dioxide from it. Actually helps maintain the atmosphere quite well. Now, we also will need to bleed in periodically metabolic oxygen, like in a SAT system if you were doing it for long periods of time. But typically during a treatment, we have the oxygen masks running and believe it or not, the amount of oxygen that leaks out of the mask from the uh, patient breathing is actually enough to keep the environment right at 21%. So rarely on a treatment do we need to add metabolic oxygen, but if we did, we could simply do it through this panel right here. And this panel has dual purposes. Uh, it has a supply and an exhaust, and it is controlled by the center valve. You follow this hose back to the manifold. It's going to go and uh, have a uh, slow opening valve for the supply and then a quarter turn ball valve for the exhaust. So this metabolic panel uh, is used in, in uh, two purposes. One, to add, up, add in metabolic oxygen on a closed circuit run, but primarily this is used for uh, using a, a oxygen breathing hood. And the way that that works is we will basically free flow oxygen through this panel into a separate hyperbaric hood. You'll see pictures of that on the website and they'll use that in hospital or therapeutic environments. We certainly don't use this commercially and put hyperbaric hoods on. The bib masks are very difficult for hospital patients to breathe off of. These are sick people, they generally have injuries, and holding a mask up uh, for long periods of time is very difficult, so they use a hood. The way that this works is we open a quarter turn ball valve, and that gives us oxygen down to our flow meter here. And we can increase or decrease the amount of supply that comes out of here and goes to a hose which goes into the hood. There's a second hose that comes and plugs into the exhaust port right here. And then this port right here will give us our exhaust flow out of the hood. So it comes through here, we open this valve, we regulate it right through here, and it comes out over the overboard dump. So you have basically a free flow hood system here, and we check that flow uh, using these valves and this flow meter here. Uh, basically, you want to set that until it breathes just fine so that the hood does not want to blow off your head. We'll do that later on in the lab. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the safety equipment that we have here in the chamber in the unlikely event of a fire. It's an inherent risk. We can never take it away, but we take extra precautions to reduce the fire hazard. But in the event of a fire, we've got to have a means to extinguish the fire and protect the occupants. We will use the fire blanket to protect the occupants and potentially smother the fire. So this is a fire blanket here. It's a hyperbaric blanket and it opens right down at the bottom in Velcro here. And the fire blanket is inside, uh, will not burn. We can use that to cover up the occupants, hide behind uh, or smother any kind of fire. As I'm telling you folks in lecture, you have a fire in the chamber, it's generally the results are pretty devastating. So our fire prevention is to actually eliminate all the risks. We do not take anything inside the chamber that we do not need. Uh, that includes uh, paper, uh, pens, uh, dive watches, etc. Anything that can create a static spark, uh, clothing, polyester clothing. Um, cigarette lighters are an absolute no-no. Uh, we don't even want to have those in the building. Uh, they become very similar to a bomb. You'll see some pictures that I have up on the website uh, of some catastrophes that have happened in that regard. But in the unlikely event of a fire, we also have a fire extinguisher here. And this is a hyperbaric fire extinguisher. It is nothing more than a canister that is filled up with water. And then we pressurize this canister via this fitting here. And this particular uh, canister is pressurized up to, this is about 90 PSI right here. So it will work uh, up to 180 feet. Um, you have a nozzle here, it's just pressurized water. We simply will remove this pin and pull this pin out, squeeze the handle, 
and point it at the base of the flame and, uh, and hope for the best. That's about all we can do. Some chambers are outfitted with hyperbaric sprinklers where they can have a deluge system where they can open a valve on the outside or the inside to run water similar to a shower uh, inside the chamber. But uh, again, uh, hyperbaric fires, they move very, very rapidly and very quickly, similar to a, a, a fire in a, in a barbecue grill. Uh, if you think about ever lighting a grill and not opening the cover, you have a gas buildup and you light it, it ignites and the fire moves very rapidly through, through, the, uh, through the system. And that's exactly what would happen in a hyperbaric chamber with high oxygen content. Okay, this is a bunk. It's an aluminum bunk, and it's really used here in DDC-1. Uh, in the event that we had two patients or we had to do a long treatment, it is a place where we could put a second patient or a tender to stretch out. And it's simply an aluminum bench. It's held up by these stainless steel chain links. And we typically will leave this thing in the folded up position. 